Welcome church, so good to be with you today. My name is Bree and uh, I just want to encourage you with Galatians 6, reminding us not to grow tired of doing good because at the perfect time, we will reap a harvest of blessing from the Lord. And I don't know what you're facing or what you're going through in your life right now, but can I just ask you, can I plead with you as I remind my own heart, just don't grow tired. Don't grow tired. Fight the good fight. Let's worship him and pray together. Heavenly Father, we do just thank you. We thank you that we can rely on you not only to be with us, but to strengthen us, to lift us up, to sit with us and comfort us when we're grieving or hurting, and to give us constant and eternal hope. If we can't think of anything else that is praiseworthy, Lord, we can think about your son Jesus, of his love that was demonstrated upon the cross for us, and of the promise we have of heaven with you because of him. We love you, Lord, and we just praise you today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing this together. Sing praise God. Oh, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him. Above the heavenly host. Oh, praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let's sing it together again. Sing praise God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Oh, praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, Lord, we are singing that praise with all kinds of different emotions in our hearts. Some of us are feeling hopeful today. Others of us are feeling hurt today. But no matter where we're at on the spectrum, Father, we look to you as the sovereign God, the one who sees all, who knows all, and as your word says, who in all, all things hold together. And so Father, with that understanding, we come together with one voice as your church, as your bride, as your people, and we agree together in what we just sang by singing Amen. Church, let's sing this together. Sing Amen. 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 Oh God, we praise you. God, we praise you. We sing together again with one voice. Amen. We believe, Lord. Amen. Amen. God, we praise you. God, we praise you. God, we praise you. God, we praise you. Oh, God, we praise you. God, we praise you. This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down 
you would lay down your life that I would be set free Whoa, Jesus I'll sing for all that you've done for me Sing who brings Who brings our chaos back into order Who makes the orphan a son and daughter The King of glory The King above all kings Who rules? Who rules the nations With truth and justice Shines like the sun in All of its brilliance The King of glory The King above all kings See this is this is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Jesus, I'll sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. So worthy, Lord. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. He's worthy. He's worthy. Worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life Thank you, Lord That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I'll sing for all that you've done for me All that you've done for me Whoa. All that you've done for sing of your love forever I could 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 sing of your love forever Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of your wonderful Son, Jesus, what a ride our nation has been experiencing. This past week with the inauguration, thinking back to the chaos before that, how we need you, God, to heal our land. This is over and above what any individual or politician or government can do. 
But we think of that time when Israel was in so much trouble and you said these words, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then you would do three wonderful things. You would hear from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their land. God, as the church, as the body of Christ, as individuals within it, teach us to humble ourselves, to esteem others as better than ourselves, to go to the, willingly to the back of the line, to prefer others. Teach us to humble ourselves and teach us to pray. Always to pray and not to complain and to gripe and to moan and to get bitter. Teach us to humble ourselves and pray and to seek your wonderful face. Not to just get answers, but to seek you because we want to know you. And thank you, Lord, that you will help us to turn from our wicked ways. Wicked ways even within your church, even within us. Lord, may we turn from our wicked ways so that then you could hear us about the healing of this land. That's our responsibility, Lord. We take it seriously to pray that you would heal this land. Lord, that you would move in a marvelous way in this nation, things we could never even imagine. Forgive our sin, Lord, as a nation and as a church and as individuals. And we call on you. I don't even know what this would look like but I ask you to heal our land. And as you so faithfully in 2 Chronicles 7, did a miracle for Israel, do it today in the United States. Hear us, we pray. Heal our land for the sake of your great name. Amen.
death could not hold you the veil tore before you you silenced the boast of sin and grave the heavens are roaring the praise of your glory for you are raised to life again you have you have no rival you have no equal now and forever god you reign yours is the kingdom yours is the glory Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus, what a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus, what a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus, we believe your name is above every other name that you are stronger, that you are more capable, that you are sovereign, that you are faithful, that you are joy. And today we rest our hope in you. We love you and we give you ourselves today. And it's in your name we pray together. Amen. Amen. All right, church, great to be with you. Let's take out our Bibles today and open up to Mark chapter 13 as we continue our verse-by-verse study in the Gospel of Mark today, looking at Mark 13, verse 1 through 13. And as you're turning there, I just want to welcome you especially. There have been many of you for the last few weeks, whether it's been Christmas Eve services or our prayer meeting that we had last week on the day of the inauguration, or even just Sunday gatherings live at the church who have uh, come to me in person and told me that it was your first time being on campus and that you have during this entire pandemic, uh, been at home watching online, and maybe you're back online today, or maybe I haven't been able to see you the entire time, and I just want you to know that I love you, I appreciate you, I'm praying for you. You are, in a sense, the other half of our congregation. It seems that that's how things are lining up right now, about half of our church family watching online and about half of our church family coming live on Sunday mornings, and I just want to say that you are appreciated and loved, and that's why we're putting this service together in this way. We want to serve you and help you continue to grow in Christ even in the midst of these crazy times. We're still on Sunday live meeting under our tent that we've rented, that we have out on the grass uh, in the middle of all the parking lots and all that. We're having a great time uh, together. And of course, as you know, uh, the virus is on the rise even in our community so we're just going to continue to monitor the situation see where things are headed see what happens in our state if we can begin to get the vaccine out there uh, in enough of a way to be able to perhaps by the spring or summer be able to meet in a different kind of way but at least for the foreseeable future it seems like we're going to keep on ministering to you and meeting together in this way and uh, so we'll just be flexible and keep on trucking Uh, in Christ. All right, today in Mark chapter 13, I want to start out by just saying that the study of Scripture inevitably leads to the formation of doctrines, okay? What that means is, as you wrestle with the Bible, as we study the passages of Scripture, we come to conclusions, and those conclusions, you can call them doctrines. Doctrines are not bad. Doctrines are Good. The study of Scripture over the centuries by God's church has helped us to understand things about God, things about God's world, and things about God's plan. And as we study Scripture, some of our conclusions, we got to write them in blood, and some of our conclusions we have to write in pen, and some of our conclusions we have to write in pencil. And what I mean by that 
is that some doctrines in the Bible are worth dying for. Brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the millennia have actually died for plenty of the doctrines in Scripture. The gospel itself, the triunity of God, the inerrancy of Scripture, these are blood doctrines. And then there's other doctrines that we'd have to say, let's write those doctrines in pen. Uh, One example from my own life would be that I believe in and I love to teach about the personal gifts of the Holy Spirit being accessible today, that God, by his Spirit, wants to give gifts to individual believers that they might serve Jesus better with the Holy Spirit gifts that God has given to them. But there are some, of course, in the church that don't believe that the gifts of the Spirit are for today. And even though I disagree, both from Scripture and my own personal experience and the experience of others, uh, I would have to say that these are doctrines that I've written in pen, so to speak. And other doctrines should be put in the pencil category because they're so hotly contested and without universal support in the church. And, and not only that, not only because there's disagreement about them, but also because they're not of primary importance or significance. Now, some of you that are listening right now, right here in this room or at home or wherever you're at, uh, you will put eschatology which is just a word that means the events of the future, the study of things in the future, the end times, prophecy. Some of you will put eschatology in the pencil category. Uh, Some of you will put it in the pen category. I think it'd be unwise for anyone to put eschatology in the blood category. There's just too much that's unknown, and true Christian fellowship does not require the same eschatological grid. You don't have to see biblical prophecies the same way in order to have Christian fellowship. In other words, someone who believes in the future pre-tribulational rapture of the church should be able to fellowship with someone who does not believe in a literal millennial reign of Christ. And some of you are saying, I don't know about either of those things, but we can still have fellowship together. Now, I'm mentioning this today because As we enter Mark chapter 13, I'll confess to you, this is a hotly debated passage of scripture. Some, like myself, believe that it communicates the doctrine of future things, that Jesus is talking about events that are still yet future to even our lifetimes and our experiences. Others, many of whom I respect and read and have friendships with, believe that the whole chapter has to do with the destruction of the Jewish temple in the first century, 70 AD. It's probably not the last time that I'll say that date today, 70 AD. And other people are in between those two views, thinking that this is a combination of events that happened in 70 AD when Jerusalem's temple was destroyed and events that will happen in the future uh, near or around the second coming of Christ. But regardless of our position on this chapter or other apocalyptic passages in scripture, like the book of Revelation, for instance, we need to treat one another with respect and humility and love. Respect because demonizing someone who's a believer with a different view about prophetic elements is just foolish. It's pointless. It really doesn't get us anywhere in the debate, the dialogue, or in Christian charity or fellowship. Humility, because, yo, we're talking about things in the future. Someday, we're going to figure out who was right and who was wrong, but none of us know with absolute certainty today. We can look back on the events of the cross, and with the epistles in our hands, know exactly what happened back then and the implications of it, but there are many things unknown that you need a measure of humility to talk about from scripture. And then of course we have to have love because this is what's required right now in the church. We need each other. As our society develops, we're going to discover that we need each other more than ever. And so we're gonna have to have fellowship with gospel-believing, Bible-believing people who do not agree with us on some of the finer points of theology. Not that the finer points of theology don't matter. I'm gonna teach through this verse by verse, and I think there are great implications for life today, given the view that I have of this passage of scripture. But it's just that we need each other right now, so we have to really love each other and have charity towards each other, okay? So that's the attitudinal backdrop that I wanted to share before we get into 
uh, Mark chapter 13. It's going to take us probably three weeks to get through this whole chapter, and today we're going to look at verse 1 through 13. So let's start out by just reading the first two verses, if you just follow along with your eyes as I read it out to you. It says, And as he came out of the temple, one of, of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Okay, let's stop right there. All right, remember the last few chapters uh, in the book of Mark. I hope you guys do. The last few weeks we've been looking at Jesus doing all sorts of things, and where did they all happen? They happen in the temple precincts. The discussions he had, the poor widow that he found, the rebuke that he had of the religious leaders, it all happened in the temple precincts. And finally here, Jesus comes out of the temple, and as he did, one of his disciples, we don't know which one, some people think it was Judas because Judas liked shiny things, pointed out the majesty and the wonder of the stones and the structures that were there. Now in Jesus' day, the temple and the platform on which it stood, oh, it was amazing. It had been under construction for 50 years. It wasn't even finished yet at this point, but it was nearing its completion. It was pioneered at this point by Herod the Great, and it was his great obsession. He loved all things grandiose, I think he thought he could build his way uh, into permanent fame even after his death. And the Temple Mount was his most spectacular triumph. There was a lot going on there. It was a large esplanade uh, that was 35 acres in size. I'm not a guy who thinks in acres, but I can think in football fields. You could fit 12 football fields within the walls of this patio. It occupied one-sixth of Jerusalem at that time. And one corner of this patio hung out over the Kidron Valley down below, and it took 15 stories of stone to fortify the retaining wall to keep it on level with the rest of the Temple Mount. And the stones that they used were massive. We know because some of the stones have actually survived to this day. I've seen stones myself that there at the Temple Mount that are the size of a school bus uh, and are so perfectly hewn that you can't fit a playing card in between it and the stone that is resting on top of it. And those were just the stones in the patio of the actual temple itself. The temple and its furnishings were on a whole other level. The records tell us that there were brass gates entering into one of the gates on the Temple Mount that were 135 feet high. The temple building itself was hewn from large white stones that they polished and brightened and decorated with gold. And gold was everywhere, shining so brightly that people said that you, in the noonday sun, could not look directly, not just at the sun, but at the temple either because it was so bright. And they've actually estimated how much this building was worth in modern dollars. It was worth apparently more than a trillion dollars by our modern estimates. This was an astounding building. It was an astounding sight. So as they're leaving the temple, one of the disciples points out the beauty of this whole thing to Jesus. You know, they spent a lot of time there in the Temple Mount, and Jesus had said a lot of stuff about the temple. He said that they had made it into a den of robbers, even though it was supposed to be a a house of prayer for all nations, but he had said nothing about how beautiful the temple had, had been. They'd gone to it three times a year for three years now, and Jesus still had not mentioned anything about the building. So he wants to know, Lord, do you see this temple? But Jesus burst this disciple's buzzle, bubble with what we saw him say in verse two. He said, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. I just gotta stop and say, sometimes we're impressed with things that Jesus is not impressed with. They were so impressed with the external thing and Jesus looked inside the heart of it and saw nothing but empty worship, rote ceremony. There was no passion for God. There was no true heart of worship. In fact, the one thing Jesus saw that impressed him was a poor widow who offered two mites worth a dollar 75 that's what impressed him not this multi-billion dollar building 
So Jesus, he just bursts this man's bubble, and this shouldn't really be a shocking statement from Jesus, given all of the rebukes that he's already given that I've already been mentioning. Now, in a previous era in the Bible, Jeremiah actually prophesied about this exact kind of thing. Through Jeremiah, God told Israel at one point that the temple that King Nebuchadnezzar had built, not the one that Herod had restored, but King Nebuchadnezzar had built, he said that the Babylonians would come and destroy it because of their ungodliness. Jeremiah 7, verse 11, God said, has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? This is where Jesus lifted that statement from. Therefore, I will do to the house that is called by my name and in which you trust and to the place that I gave to you and to your fathers, I will do to it as I did to Shiloh. Now, Shiloh was a place that God's tabernacle had dwelt in a previous era. And because of ungodliness in a previous era, God had judged that region and the tabernacle was no longer in Shiloh. God had judged Shiloh. And so through Jeremiah, God told a previous generation, look, you made my house into a house of robbers. The Babylonians are coming and they're going to decimate this place. And that's exactly what happened. Herod then rebuilt this temple and now here comes Jesus saying Jeremiah-like things. The destruction is coming again because of the ungodliness that's found inside of this city and inside of this temple. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Just like Jesus predicted in the year 70 AD, just a short while after Jesus spoke these words, the Romans invaded Jerusalem. They were led by a general named Titus, and he ordered the destruction of the temple. They lit it on fire and the gold melted into the crevices and cracks of the stones. And once the fire subsided, in an effort to re recover all of that gold, they toppled each one of the stones over, just like Jesus had predicted. That was a brutal period for the Jews. It was a foreshadowing of many terrible eras throughout their history. It's estimated that two million Jews died during the period that the Romans invaded Jerusalem at that, at that, in that era. And the destruction of the Temple Mount was so complete that future visitors to the Temple Mount can actually not even discern where the old temple used to sit on that uh, patio or on that space. If you go there today, I've actually walked on this Temple Mount. If you go there today, scholars will tell you that they have an idea of where the temple might have been, but it was so completely decimated and removed by the Romans that they don't know for sure where it actually was. I'm just pointing all this out to say Jesus' prophecy came to pass quite literally. What he said actually occurred. All right, so that's the first movement of this passage. Now let's go on into verse 3. It says, and as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? All right, so they go and they sit on the Mount of Olives. Okay, these guys are shell-shocked. You know, they love the temple. They thought it was amazing. And so Peter, James, and John and Andrew, these are the upper echelon of Jesus' leadership team. My theory is that Peter, James, and John were the main three Jesus was uh, pouring into and that Andrew, who always appears very responsible in scripture, was in charge of the rest of the disciples <laughs> while Jesus was taking care of those three. But they get together on the Mount of Olives and there they are overlooking the temple itself. This, by the way, is the very place that the Lord said that he would return in glory. Zechariah 14, verse four says that on the day that the Lord returns, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley so that one half of the mount shall move north, the other half south, and verse eight, on that day, listen to this, I love this, this is still going to happen in the future, Living waters shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. Okay? 
What, what I think that means is that one day Jesus will return to the Mount of Olives and usher in everlasting peace and an everlasting kingdom. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about that today. We'll get into that in subsequent weeks. But I believe very literally that this is going to occur And I'm very much looking forward to this time. I think it'll be a thousand years of worldwide peace where Jesus himself is ruling and doing what every world leader in combination could not do for the last however many years of human history. But on that mountaintop where Jesus is going to come back one day, the four disciples asked him when all of these things would happen. They were thinking about the destruction of the temple, and they thought that that meant that the new messianic era would come in, so they wanted to know, when will all these things be accomplished? That's their question in verse 4. Now, Matthew and Luke, for their part, they also talk about, they also record this teaching from Jesus. It's called the Olivet Discourse, if you want to sound like a smarty pants with your friends. (laughs) And when Matthew records this question, he says it this way. Look at the screen with me. He said, tell us, when will these things be? And, or they asked, tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Okay, that kind of makes it a little clearer than the way that Mark records it. That, that is what they're asking in the Gospel of Mark, but Matthew helps us understand. They're thinking the destruction of the temple, that's the end of the age. When is the end of the age going to occur? And Jesus, in his response, is going to really, in a sense, deal with all three of those things. The temple's destruction in 70 AD, the rebuilt temple's eventual destruction, and the sign of his return at the end of the age. Now, when I say it like that, it becomes obvious, like I've been saying, that I believe these events are future events. I think this is the, I th- I think this is the right way to think about this passage And there's a few reasons why I think that these are future events that Jesus is predicting. So if you want to write these down, here are some of my reasons. First of all, I'm just so closely tied to a literal interpretation of the Bible when at all possible. What I mean by when at all possible is obviously there's allegories in the Bible that need to be interpreted allegorically. But when it can be interpreted literally, I am tied to that mode of interpretation. I think that Early in the church's history, there was a debate about the way to interpret the Bible, and I'm glad that the literalists, at least for the most part, won that debate. Second, I feel this way because I like the Old Testament. And when I read the Old Testament prophets, there's just too much stuff in there about a future day where the glory of the Lord will cover the earth, where Jesus will rule and reign visibly, where the lion and the lamb will lie down together, where the elements of the curse will be reversed and will live in harmony and peace together and it's just too hard for me to take those in a spiritual sense i believe they are still coming third uh, it's hard to ignore the labor pains that jesus is going to talk about in our passage today labor pains like war famine and earthquakes you know how labor pains work they start they get more intense they build up until birth occurs and it seems like that's what we're watching in our planet today things getting more and more intense until the time comes when Jesus will return. Fourth, the view that this is all something that occurred in 70 AD is weird to me when you consider that it's written about three times in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke record this teaching from Jesus, and they wrote these things somewhere in the 40s, 50s, or maybe 60s in that first century. And it'd take a while for these writings to spread around through the church. So why would we have a threefold witness about something that occurred in 70 AD? It just seems like something that must be future. Why would it be recorded for us if it pertained only that first generation? Fifth, I believe, in telescoped prophecies. This happens in the Old Testament also, where there's an initial fulfillment, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, but it's actually just a foreshadowing of something that will happen later in the future. And we'll see this as we move through this chapter. And also, I believe this sixth, because if Jesus is only talking about the calamity of the events in the seven, at 70 AD in this passage, what that has to mean is that the kingdom of God only came after 70 AD, because that, that line of interpretation says that the, when Jesus talks about the flashing of lightning and the Son of Man coming, that's the coming of the kingdom of God. It's not the literal second coming of Jesus, but it's the coming of the kingdom of God. Well, they all confess that that's a 
spiritual coming of the kingdom. But man, when I read the book of Acts, it sure looks like the kingdom came in a pretty spiritual and powerful sense to me, and that's way before 70 AD. So I don't think that things were on pause from the ascension to 70 AD. And seventh and finally, and I've got more reasons than this, but I just decided to have mercy on y'all today. I believe that the evidence shows that the book of Revelation was written after 70 AD. You see, some will think that the book of Revelation is also talking about the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. But if it was written after 70 AD, it doesn't make sense to me that that's what that book would be all about. I think we're dealing with future events. All right, so those are some of the reasons. Like I said, I have a a few more. One of them is very significant. Verse 19, Jesus said, this would be the worst tribulation ever. And that means to me, ever. Worse than the Holocaust, worse than 70 AD, worse than the bubonic plague. And so to me, that speaks of something that is yet to occur. All right, so like I said, I believe the events that Jesus taught about in this passage are yet future Some of the things will contain or deal with the first century context, but I think we're talking about future things. So all of that, (laughs) all of that, all of that complexity to say this is actually going to be a really simple Bible study. And what I mean by that is that Jesus is going to describe future troubles on earth. Then he'll describe a period of great tribulation. Then he'll describe his return, and then he'll tell us how he wants us to act today, okay? He's gonna tell us about future troubles on earth, then he'll describe the great tribulation, then he'll describe his return, and then he'll tell us how he wants us to act today. And that's what we'll be looking at over the next three weeks. All right, so let's look at the first part of that, the future troubles on earth. These are things that we're living in right now. So let's start in verse five. It says, and Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. All right, that's the first part of what's coming, Jesus told his followers. Uh, there's, a, there's a tendency to be led astray, he said, and some would come and try to lead astray by saying, I'm the Christ, you need to follow me. Now, Many have and many will actually come in Jesus' literal name, claiming to be the Messiah, claiming to be the Christ and deceive many. But I think you could also think about this in the form of ideologies or movements or individuals that arise and take a messianic tone. They might not say, I'm the Christ, but they will say something like, follow me, I'll deliver you. You know, my thoughts my policies, my way of looking at the world, it is the salvation that the world needs. Now fortunately, we can protect ourselves from this deception by connecting to the teaching of historic Christianity as found in scripture. You know, the church has passed down a treasure of instruction and doctrine, and as we learn the word, our roots grow deep, so we're not so deceivable when these false messiahs come along and say, hey, come on to my team, follow me. No, we're able to look at that and say, no, it's fake news. I'm not gonna follow you because my roots are down deep into the historic teaching of the church as found in the word of God. Now, of course, we know that when Jesus comes, he, his return will, will be very visible, okay? So we don't have to wonder, is this really the Christ? Is this really the Messiah? Revelation 1 verse 7 says it like this, behold, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. So when Jesus comes, it's not going to be secret. It's not going to be like, hey, man, I think I found this guy in a chat room on the internet. He might be Jesus. It's not going to be like that. He's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see who he is. Okay, but he goes on and says something that we probably can relate to a little bit more closely. Verse seven. He said, and when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place for the end, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning 
of the birth pains. All right, here Jesus warned about the coming of various calamities. And he's got this crazy list, wars, earthquakes, famines. When you read Luke's account of this, he throws in an extra one, pestilences. All right, so COVID-19 is on the list. All right, we've got our fair share of all of these, right? You know, we, we, it used to be in human history that wars happen between neighboring clans, but now we have the technological capability to war with people, bomb people on the other side of the planet. Uh, earthquakes and other disasters induced by the brokenness and decay of our planet seem to be increasing. Famine, even after all of our technological advances, all of our humanitarian efforts, famine still and always exists. I think it's like a third of the world is always hungry. Not because of overpopulation, don't let them tell you that, it's because of greed, because of selfishness, and because of human dysfunction. We're bad at administering stuff like this. So you got all of this stuff. It's a cacophony of bad that Jesus points out. And Jesus' point, notice what he said in verse seven. He said, these events must take place, but the end is not yet. These signs, in other words, are not the end. Jesus said they are, verse eight, the beginning of the birth pains. Just the very beginning. Now, if you don't know how birth pains work, let me mansplain it to you. (laughs) Once they begin, they steadily increase in frequency and intensity. Okay, this seems to be the course of the events that Jesus pointed out, increasing in frequency and intensity, getting us closer to, listen to me now, the birth of a new world. Okay, remember the mindset of so many in the Old Testament. I'm sure it's bothered some of you at times when you read the Old Testament, that babies were such a big deal to them, and when they got married, if a woman couldn't, couldn't have a baby, it was, like a, it just was devastating to them. You know, barrenness, uh, inability, infertility, it was devastating to them. The the woman always thought it was their fault in those cultures. And when they had a child, right or wrong, they thought of it as the removal of a disgrace. Birth rectified a problem. So here, when we see the planet going through birth pains, wars, earthquakes, pestilences, famine, What we can know is that it is readying itself for the rectifying of a problem. It's broken and decaying and full of sin, but something good is coming. But again, what Jesus said is the end is not yet. In the midst of all that, the end is not yet. And because the end is not yet, when these events occur, Jesus commanded his followers to do something very simple. Verse seven, don't you love exhortations like these in the Bible? Do not be alarmed, he says. (laughs) Okay, so when this stuff happens, we're not supposed to get rattled and shaken. The disciple is meant to see wars, rumors of wars, calamities in the natural world, famines, disease, as the inevitable birth pains required to get us to the new world. Jesus is coming, and we should not be shaken when these uproarious events unfold before our eyes. And if you're having a hard time imagining some of these events, I'd encourage you to hop on Twitter for a second, read the news for a second, because all these things are happening every single day. Okay, but Jesus went on in verse nine, and he said this, but be on your guard. For they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues. And you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. Here Jesus warned his disciples about the coming persecution. Okay, and This is something Jesus did a lot. He liked to prepare his people, his men, with statements like this one. The Gospels are littered with words like these, like John 15, verse 19, if you look on the screen there. If you were of the world, Jesus said, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. He just said stuff like this all the time to help prepare these guys for the hostility they were going to experience. 
And this portion of Jesus' prophecy has clearly come to pass. The church has experienced waves of persecution for 2,000 years now. And of course, our modern world is no exception. Believers all over the world are being persecuted today. There's a ministry called Open Doors Ministry. They have a great website. They just released their 2020 World Watch list of the top 50 countries where it's most difficult to follow Jesus. By the way, we're not on the list, United States of America. North Korea, Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya, and Pakistan round, round out the top five. But, but in that list of 50, they also include the source of the persecution. And the sources are all these. Communist oppression, clan oppression, Islamic oppression, religious nationalism, denominational protectionism, dictatorial paranoia, and organized crime. Those are the culprits. Those are the ones persecuting the church in our modern world. But of course, here in the West, we will also experience a lighter level of persecution, and I think it will increase in the years to come. I I don't think it's hard to imagine religious freedoms reduced to just what you do in your home by yourself. You can't have an opinion or a belief that is contrary to the norms of society is what will be preached at us. Many corporations and professional fields, I think, in the generations to come will actually be off limits for Christian kids growing up, trying to figure out what they're gonna be when they're older because biblical thinkers won't be allowed in some of those fields and companies. Many will have little little tolerance for someone with a biblical worldview. So how do we respond to all that? Well, Jesus said in verse 9 and 10, be on your guard, and the gospel must be first proclaimed to all nations. In other words, we're not meant to sit around pining for the day we can get out of here. We're we're not meant for endless conjecture about when Christ might return. Instead, we're meant to soberly move forward with the gospel. Here's a hint, you guys. The gospel is for a broken world. So when the broken world is acting like a broken world, it needs the gospel. The gospel is what must be proclaimed. It's the message humanity needs. So how do we proclaim the glorious message of Jesus, his death, burial, resurrection, and all its implications? Well, we receive it, we ingest it, we study it, we live in accordance with it, and we say it to others. But Jesus went on, let's read verse 11. He said, and when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it's not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. You know, a lot of us, we're nervous about what we might be like if we're pressed in a hostile way about Jesus. We worry if persecution were to really come that we wouldn't honor him with our lives. But here's what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to trust the Holy Spirit in and with those moments. We can know that in those moments, the Spirit is there available to give us the words to speak. You can just quietly, without saying a word, internally say, God, help me right now. Give me the words right now. Show me what to say right now. So just keep growing in Jesus, walking with Jesus, abiding in Jesus, and if hostility arises against you for Jesus' name, lean into his spirit. He will help you speak. And don't click send until you know it was the Holy Spirit that told you to say what you said. All right, let's close with our last two verses today. It says, and brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child And children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Here Jesus talks about a brand of hostility that is off the charts. You got brother against brother, father against child, children against parents. It sounds intense, but it's actually not all that uncommon. 
There are communities and cultures and countries on earth today that have created such severe barriers to coming to Christ that if you do convert to Christianity, you are ostracized from those you love at least and perhaps even marked for death or torture at worst. And this level of vitriol isn't reserved only for families. Jesus said in verse 13, you'll be hated by all for my name's sake. Now these disciples are getting the truth from Jesus. He's preparing them. They and many after them were bound to suffer. All kinds of people have hated the church throughout the centuries. But Jesus knew it would happen. He knew it was for his name's sake. So he encouraged us, exhorted us to endure. That word endure means to remain under. To have all this crazy heaped upon you and to keep plugging away because your hope is in Christ and his kingdom. Now I know this has been a long teaching today and I just want to close by warning you of some dangerous conclusions that many believers have come to as a result of the passage I just taught and perhaps even the way I just taught it. Now, these conclusions are not the fault of Scripture. It, the Scripture is without error, but the errors are of our own making. And I just want to point out three dangerous errors that believers have made as a result of thinking about the coming hostility and world in this way. First, we make the mistake of forgetting that people are made in God's image. You see, there's doctrines in the Bible about mankind's sinful nature or doctrines like these about the coming persecution that people will bring against the church. And so because of those doctrines, some believers have concluded that the non-believing world is incapable of any good. But we're all made in God's image, so we should expect broken people to do good things. That leads me to a second error that, that people sometimes make. We forget about common grace. You see, God made this world and he made everything in it. Though broken by sin, God has given common grace to our world. So we should expect scientific breakthroughs, uh, wisdom in society building, and beauty in culture to come from an unconverted world. S someone might read a passage like this and say to themselves, man, if an unbelieving scientist or group of scientists creates a vaccine, there's no way I'm touching it because they're the kind of people that do this kind of stuff. Now, I'm not telling you whether you should take a vaccine or not. I'm just telling you that biblically, we should be the kind of people who say to ourselves, because of common grace and being made in God's image, there are going to be unbelieving scientists who could produce good for us because of common grace and being made in God's image. And then I think another mistake that we sometimes make is we start labeling everything religious persecution. It's not, okay? Sometimes Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. That's persecution. But sometimes he was just different than everybody else in Babylon. That's just living in exile. That's just being a believer in a culture that isn't. And sometimes God's people have to learn how to live in exile. So I hope this little passage from Jesus helps prepare you for the times that we're in today and will continue to be in in the years to come. God bless you, church. I miss you so much. We'll see you next Sunday. Hey, church, so great worshiping with you today. Before you go, I've got just a few announcements for you. The first is about our upcoming men's conference. We're so excited about this because it's been a crazy year. It's been difficult to gather with friends and family and our church family. And so this is a way while honoring all the COVID guidelines, the men of our church can come together to be filled and poured into in, by the word and worship and time together, fellowshipping, playing games, getting outside, sharing a meal. There'll be a $10 box lunch available for you. So I would just encourage you to come and spend some time with your brothers in the faith at our men's conference this year. You can register online today. We also want to let you know about Intro to Calvary because this event is one for those of you that are either new to our church or maybe have been coming for a little while but want to know a little bit more. Deciding to call a church your home church is a big decision. And so we want you to have all the information that you need, have all your questions answered. We have our first one of the 2021 year coming up next Sunday after the 930 service. It's just going to be a brief 
30 minute intro to Calvary led by our pastors. There'll be breakfast free of charge available to you. So go ahead and sign up online today to reserve your meal. Lastly, we just wanna talk a little bit about life groups. If you've been coming to our church for any amount of time, you've heard us talk about these because it's a big deal to us. Life groups is how we break out of the larger church body and gather together, even if it's virtually, to be able to bear one another's burdens, to shoulder the difficulties of life with each other, to pray and encourage and lift each other up, to build real relationships. And so the life group season that's coming up will go from March until May. Online signups will begin in February, and we'd really encourage you to come out and be a part of this important and vital ministry that we have here at Calvary Monterey. We're also looking for some new leaders. Maybe the Lord is um, nudging you to be able to take that next step. If you're interested, we have some potential leader meetings coming up next Sunday after both morning services or online at two o'clock. If that's something that's on your heart, sign up today. We'd love to have you join and take a new step in this important ministry. Church, that's all I've got for you today. Have a wonderful and blessed week, and we hope to see you here next time. Take care.